Welcome back humans. Today we're going to talk about soggy cereal syndrome, where we're going to delve into the mysteries of breakfast mishaps and unravel the science behind the soggy cereal. I'm Jason. Today we're going to pour ourselves a bowl of curiosity as we explore why milk has a knack for turning our favorite cereals into mush and the science behind it. Now, to understand why milk makes cereal soggy, we first need to examine the properties of both milk and cereal. Now, cereal is typically made from grains like wheat, oats, rice, and so on, which contain starches and sugars that give them their crunchy texture. But when milk is added to cereal, several processes occur that lead to the dreaded soggy cereal syndrome. One of the main culprits is the phenomenon known as capillary action. Now this occurs when the milk is absorbed into the small pores and crevices of the cereal pieces, causing them to become saturated and lose their crispness. Additionally, the sugars and starches in the cereal can dissolve in the milk, further contributing to the softening effect. Now we've all dealt with capillary action. It's basically how paper towels work. When you rip off a paper towel and just put the corner of it in a drop of water, you will see that the water is sort of drawn up through the fibers. And that is an interaction between the uh, intermolecular forces of the, of the water molecules and the fibers of the paper. And so it appears to defy gravity. What's really going on is because the molecules are attracted to the fibers through the intermolecular forces. So that's capillary action. And and basically, when you dump milk on a bunch of cereal, because really good cereal is full of lots of crevices and nice crunchy bits there, then the capillary action draws the milk inside and causes it to be soggy. So the bottom line is if you have a cereal that has a lot of surface area, either because it's flat and broad, or if it's some sort of spherical situation with lots of pores going into the inside, it's very easy for that kind of cereal to draw in the milk due to surface tension and capillary action. And so it kind of gets soggy more or less from the inside out very rapidly. But if you have cereal with lots of nuts or clusters that are compactified together, it's more difficult for the milk to get inside due to capillary action, and so it stays crunchy a little bit longer. The surface tension of a liquid is the property of that liquid that causes its surface, as we mentioned before, to behave sort of like a stretched elastic membrane. This unique phenomena is what allows insects like water striders to walk on the water and droplets to form perfect spheres. And you can see this phenomenon yourself. Just pour some water on a counter, spread it out, and so you can see the little individual droplets and get up very, very close. And you will see the sort of spherical nature. When you think about it, it's a liquid, so it should form a perfectly flat structure. But if you look at the edges, you will see that it curves up and sort of forms a spherical shape there, and that's directly due to the surface tension. So let's dive a little bit deeper into these forces inside of liquids that make your cereal soggy. First, let's talk about hydrogen bonding, which is the most important intermolecular force of water. So this is a water molecule, H2O. Here's two hydrogens, the white ones, this is H2, and the oxygen is red in the middle. Here's a, another one right here next door, so H2O. Now, because oxygen can attract electrons really, really strongly, and hydrogen cannot hold its electron cloud there very, very well, what happens is these black sticks represent sharing of electrons between the atoms. But what's really going on is that the oxygen atom can pull the electron cloud a little bit closer uh, uh, and, and kind of steal them away from the hydrogen. So it's still being shared, but the cloud is pulled a little bit closer to the oxygen. So what this actually means is that the hydrogen atom becomes a little bit bare of electrons and it becomes net positive charge because remember there's a proton in here and these oxygen atoms become a little bit negatively charged since the electron cloud is more situated in this direction. So basically, half of the water molecule, the oxygen side, is actually slightly negatively charged, and the other half, the hydrogen side, is actually slightly positive charged. So this is called a dipole situation, or this has a dipole. That just means di means two, and pole means charge. So it just means it's got two different charges, on one on each side of the molecule. Now, every water molecule behaves like this. 
the oxygens are slightly negative, and they're going to be attracted to the hydrogens, which are slightly positive. There's a little bit of attraction there, right? And there's a little bit of attraction here. Now, if these two oxygens come together, they're both negative, so there's a little bit of repulsion there. But basically, there's attractive forces between the water molecules because we have negative on the oxygen and positive net charge on the hydrogen. So that's hydrogen bonding. It causes a attraction between the water molecules, and so when we're at the surface of a liquid where there's water down below, every water molecule is being attracted to every other water molecule slightly, but they're not being attracted to the air because there's no net charge on the air above. And so it contracts inward, creating the skin that we call the surface tension. And as I said a minute ago, this is also responsible for water's relatively high boiling point as well. Because since there's a lot of intermolecular attraction, it takes a lot of heat to be dumped into the water to get them to move fast enough to break apart and then to float away as vapor. It explains a lot of properties of water. Now we're saying that any molecule can basically have intermolecular attraction. How can that be? So this is water. We know that there's a dipole moment here. We know the oxygen's slightly negative and the hydrogens are always slightly positive. But even if that wasn't the case, for any molecule that you can come up with, What's really going on is the electrons and the black sticks are shared between atoms. So any molecule you could come up with has sharing of electrons of some kind going on. Carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, whatever. I can keep going on. Carbon monoxide, they're sharing electrons or they're transferring electrons. All right. Now, what you need to stop doing is stop trying to visualize an electron as a ball that like orbits something like a planet. It's not like that at all. When you get into chemistry and quantum mechanics, we learn that electrons are not really pinpoint, uh, they're not really objects that we can say are in a specific position at a specific time. When we look at a molecule like this and we see shared electrons here, what we really are saying is that the electron is forming a probability cloud of being somewhere over here, somewhere. But that means that sometimes if we measure the position of the electron, it might be around the hydrogen. And sometimes we might measure its position to be somewhere close to the oxygen. And sometimes we might measure its position to be right in the middle. But if we measure it a thousand times, it'll seem to be more around the oxygen more often, and it'll seem to be hanging around the hydrogen a little bit less often. And that basically means that over time, this oxygen looks a little negative, and this hydrogen looks a little positive. But at any given moment of time, it really can be anywhere. And it's kind of random. That's the nature of quantum mechanics. So even if I pick a random molecule like carbon monoxide or whatever, the electrons that are between the atoms really can exist in a cloud around the atom and sometimes around the molecule. And sometimes the electron can be over here, sometimes can be over here. And so completely randomly, any molecule can have electrons at any moment of time clustered around one of the atoms in the molecule. And then it can have a very temporary dipole, which means charge imbalance across the molecule, just by, by nature of random chance. So if I take a thousand snapshots of carbon dioxide, I might find that some of those times, the carbon is a little positive and the oxygen is a little negative, and sometimes it'll be flipped around. So it's like the electrons are in a cloud and you really never know where they're going to be. So even if you don't predict ahead of time that a molecule will be polar, sometimes randomly, one half of the molecule can be positive and the other negative, and sometimes it can be flipped around. And that means that because this process is happening completely randomly and we can't know ahead of time what's really going on, there are always weak attractive forces between molecules. Because neighboring molecules, if they happen to have a, a dipole moment uh, randomly generated at a random time, then they will randomly attract each other, but just not quite as strongly as water and other highly polar molecules. So are there any solutions to this dire situation? Is there any way to prevent the soggy cereal syndrome? While we may not be able to stop it completely, there are a few strategies we can employ to prolong our delightful crunchiness in the morning. One option is to use less milk or to add the milk very gradually while you eat. By doing this and controlling the ratio of the milk to the cereal, you can minimize the amount of time the cereal spends in contact with the milk, reduce its likelihood of becoming soggy. Another approach is to choose cereals that are specifically formulated to maintain their crunchiness in milk. Some manufacturers use special coatings or additives to help their cereals retain their texture for longer, even when submerged in milk. So the next time you find yourself facing a bowl of soggy cereal, take a moment and appreciate the fascinating interplay of physics, 
chemistry, and all of the other things that we talked about today that are inside of your cereal bowl at the breakfast table. And remember, even if your cereal is a little bit mushy, it's still a delicious way to start your day. I'd like to thank you all for hanging out with me today and talking about this. I find it fascinating that something as commonplace as a bowl of cereal, we can actually use that to talk about some really cool chemistry and physics at the microscopic level. All the little things going on in a simple bowl of cereal that we can talk about and understand, I just think it personally is fascinating. So. Enjoy your day. Please drop me a line. Let me know what you think. And remember, always stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.